So you can turn a toy car into a flashlight. <laughs> the other night I was reading and the power went out. My first thought was to grab one of my mini battery powered lights and continue reading. But then I thought, well, I'm not sure how long this power outage is going to last. I might need these lights at a more important time. So I sat in the dark and just waited till the power came on. I started thinking about this old rechargeable flashlight that I had as a kid. It kind of worked like a shake weight. <laughs> you just shook it back and forth and it would charge the battery inside, giving you light in the event of an emergency. By the way, I looked these up and they still make them. Not telling you to buy one. There's a link below in case you just wanna look at them but I'm apprehensive. When I was a kid, the thing about this flashlight was it lasted like 30 seconds before you had to keep shaking it again. Now, maybe I just wasn't shaking it long enough before making light. Anyway, I wasn't a fan. It was nice in an emergency, didn't use it any other time, and then eventually it just stopped working. Anyway, this got me thinking, and by thinking, I mean spiraling into this survival situation mode. If all the power went out, everywhere in the world did I have the tools at home to make a makeshift rechargeable flashlight, or at the very least, a reading light. Well, we won't know unless we try, so let's jump into it. The number one goal of the challenge was try to upcycle whatever I can. This basically means if there's something I'm not using anymore, try to repurpose that thing into this project. I didn't want to use my copper wire or my magnets to build something because those could be more important sometime later in this hypothetical situation. <laughs> Luckily, I already had a pretty good idea of how I was going to make power. Say hello to my toy car. This has been sitting on a shelf for eight years unused. One day it just stopped driving and I just never got rid of it. So makes the perfect sacrificial object for this challenge. I'm just hoping the problem was the controller and not the motors. So here's a really cool thing about DC motors. When you apply a voltage to them, they spin. But what makes them perfect for this project is that when you turn the motor yourself, you generate electricity. So we know we have a working motor to act as our generator. There is one more thing, well, three more things, we can snag from this car to help with the project. The LEDs. I have a mountain of LEDs to use that would probably be better for this project, but once again, every part matters at the end of the world. <laughs> so we're gonna take two from the car and one from the remote. And after connecting these LEDs to the motor, we know that the motor works and the LEDs work. Now we have light, but it lasts a very short amount of time, basically only kicking in for half a second. So how do we store and dissipate that energy so our light is actually usable? In past projects, you've seen me use these LiPo batteries, it's this little guy right here, um, to power Arduinos and things. And if you're thinking one of those would be good, then honestly, a LiPo battery, that's not a bad idea, but I'm not sure if it's the best thing for this project. Both LiPo batteries and super capacitors store and release electrical energy. However, they both excel in different areas of this science. LiPos excel at high energy capacity, which would give us longer run times, while super capacitors excel at ultra fast charging, but hold far less total energy. In this setting, we're, we're only getting a peak voltage of 2.4 when we're lucky. We need something that can efficiently store that energy instantly. And for me, that means supercapacitors. In my limited understanding of batteries, the other reason I don't really wanna use a LiPo is you have to charge them at around four volts. And if we're only getting 2.4 volts, we'd have to up that voltage through a circuit and then we'd be losing some energy in the process and I think it just wouldn't be as efficient. Correct me if I'm wrong, if you know a way to do this super efficiently, better than capacitors, we can update this at a later date when I remake this project because, <laughs> well, we'll get there. So let's do a test with a few super capacitors and see what kind of runtime we're getting. I had a ton of these 2.7 volt, uh, one farad super caps left over from an electronics haul. And while I probably could have pulled these out of something like my UPS, I'd rather not destroy that for this video. <laughs> 
So I decided to go with four capacitors to increase our overall storage of energy, our overall capacitance, to see how long we could really get this light going without too much added rotation of the motor. Now I should have hooked up my multimeter here to tell when we were at our maximum voltage, but I kind of waited too long and when I realized it, I just had to commit to eyeballing it to when the LED reached its brightest point <laughs> with amount of spins. Now on video, you can't really tell how bright this LED is, but I'm honestly beyond excited by these results. This is 10 times speed right here, and we got over three minutes of pretty solid light. 30 seconds of cranking the motor for three to four minutes of light. Seems like a fantastic return on energy exerted. Now we just have to transfer this to a prototyping board and figure out how we are going to house it. I love these little prototyping boards. Basically, once you finish something on the breadboard, you just throw it into this and you can move stuff around. I started with a resistor there and the diode at a weird angle. And by the end, I just decided I didn't need the resistor and put in a switch and then soldered everything up. Here I am using a rechargeable soldering iron because I wanted to prove to myself that if the world went dark and I didn't have power, I'd still be able to make this. I am not a fan of this one though, the Fantic. That's just me, not a fan, would not suggest buying it. But there we go, it's working with the switch. For the housing, I went with an old T10 I found in a bin of recyclables. Mounting this motor was probably the most difficult aspect of this build. Due to the way the housing is shaped, I wasn't able to use super glue, or in a survival situation, I would try using pine pitch glue, but since the motor wouldn't sit flush with the tin, glue wasn't really an option. So I went with an even more archaic option, <laughs> and we used clay. I've had this extra chunk of clay for two years now, and it kind of adds to the survival simulation. Now there are some very obvious flaws with using clay. Firstly, moisture. The only reason the clay is malleable is because of its water content. So until it dries, our motor is going to be exposed to way more moisture than it probably should be. The main worry with moisture is corrosion. The next problem is that clay shrinks as it dries. So. Even though the fit will be super snug at the start, things may loosen up over time. I could see using pine glue or hot glue around the edges of the clay once everything dries to keep things from wobbling around. But for now, I think we'll get by. So ignore this, we're going to continue here and get our little board hanging inside the cavity here about that far down. So we're going to drill at the corners and then use some stretchy string to suspend everything. We go ahead and attach the last piece. Here's the setting. It's the end of the world. You just grabbed a bunch of random parts from around your house and made a light because you have a book. You saved one book for the end of the world. I'm not sponsored. I just bought this because I thought it'd be an interesting read. You bought this book and you're like, you know what? I want to read at night so I'm ready for the morning. So I'm ready to tackle the day and use some new skills. So you have your light ready, you have your book, and now it's nighttime. Click. So you reach for your light, you flip the switch. Oh my God, find the switch. Okay, here we go. Oh, wait. <laughs> wait, that's sick. I'm gonna continue reading until the light is too dark to read from and we have to crank again. And that'll be our runtime for our capacitors. All 
All right, so now we're at a point where I can still read with it, but I'd probably crank it. I don't think it's showing up at all on camera now. The book isn't, but I can still read it just fine with my eyes. All right, I'm still able to read, but I'm gonna go ahead and crank it. Once again, may even be brighter than the first time. <laughs> so qualms with this design so far. One, it's bulky, but it's also super cool. This is the lid for it over here. Uh, right now I'm doing a clay project and that's why the lid is being used for some water. Um, but you can just throw a lid on this. Um, put it away in your room, you know? <laughs> it's just something that'll look weird, uh, but actually has a use when your power goes out. Uh, if you don't have a flashlight or the batteries have died, you just grab this, give it some cranks, and then you have an emergency light. When it is fully charged, it is crazy bright. Uh, we saw the runtime there. It has a pretty good runtime. I thought it would be far less substantial and what, 10, maybe 15, 20 spins of this gets it basically fully charged and you get that length of time. That is crazy. When I was a kid, I had a flashlight that you would shake. It had a magnet in the core and then a copper coil. And so that's how it would charge when you shook it. It would go back and forth through the coil and charge like the capacitors. That thing lasted like 30 seconds. Um, this is significantly better. I love using the red LEDs. I need to fact check this, but growing up, I was always taught uh, in Boy Scouts that using red light uh, doesn't make your eyes dilate as much. So it basically, allow it doesn't sacrifice your night vision when you're using red light. I'm not sure if that's true, but that was always what I was taught. And so for me, that's an added bonus. At night, if you're reading and you're in a position where you can't, you know, gosh, you just need to be on alert at times. You don't want to sacrifice your night vision, so that's cool. Now, the number one problem with what I did is probably the clay. <laughs> uh, clay's heavy. So holding this like this, uh, you feel it. It actually feels really good at first, but as you get tired, you know, you want to rest your hand on something. So yeah, clay was definitely not the best option here. But all in all, I'm really happy with how this came out. The reason I took the wheel off is because I was thinking of drilling a hole through the little pin here and then using a cord to wrap around and then pulling. So you wrap it and then pull and that would give you some more, I think a longer time of getting the max voltage. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> but that's something I think I'm gonna experiment with. If you liked this and you want a less casual video and just a how-to step-by-step, I have the footage. I could totally edit that down. If that's something people are interested in. That would also challenge me to go over, refresh exactly how all this is working. And yeah, it'd be fun. So let me know if that's something you're interested in. Thanks for watching. I'm looking forward to your ideas. Everybody always has so many fun things to throw in. Uh, I think the one takeaway I have is, do I have the motor here? One second. Okay, I do. So this is the other motor. Uh, in hindsight, I'd probably want to build something around the motor with the LEDs that you could hold like this and then turn and then it'd be like something you hold like that. I think that'd be a lot less bulky. But again, using the T10, I think is such a, uh, a little novelty look to it. So I'm not too bummed about that. But again, looking forward to your ideas. Thanks again for watching and have a fantastic day, evening, night, whenever it is that you're watching this. And I'll see you in the next one.